and welcome to the MBOM podcast, where you'll learn to master the business of yoga. MBOM is a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Amanda Kingsmith. I'm a 500 hour registered yoga teacher, a yoga business coach, and a total business geek. Here at MBOM, you'll learn everything you need to know to create a sustainable yoga business by learning from myself and guests from around the world about how they built their yoga businesses and about how you too can become a successful yoga teacher, studio owner, and much more. All right, let's dive in. Hey friends, I just wanted to pop in and talk a little bit about MBO behind the scenes. When I entered the yoga world as a teacher, I was surprised by how many yoga teachers were struggling with the business side of yoga. And that's why I created MBO. MBOM helps yoga teachers and studio owners become entrepreneurs. It helps you to go from surviving to thriving with your yoga business. I am on a mission to change the yoga industry, to teach yoga teachers and studio owners about the business of yoga, and to help you feel more confident, successful, and abundant. After releasing hundreds of podcast episodes, I want to create content that dives deeper into helping yoga entrepreneurs thrive and elevate their businesses. This is where MBOM Behind the Scenes comes in. Each week, you will get bonus content from the weekly guest or myself, diving deeper into how you can take the teachings and apply them to your business. This podcast is designed for yoga teachers and studio owners who are ready to take it to the next level. If you enjoy MBOM and have been looking for an affordable way to learn more, this is it. For the cost of two lattes per month, you will get never before heard content that you can't access anywhere else that will give you tangible ways to dive deeper into your yoga business. If this sounds like something you're interested in, let's dive in. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash MBM yoga and sign up to get behind the scenes now. Once again, that's patreon.com forward slash MBOM yoga to get all the exclusive behind the scenes content. I'll see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the MBM podcast. I'm excited that you're joining me for today's episode of the show. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Offering Tree an all-in-one, easy-to-use online business platform that I've been working with for years. If you're looking to save time, energy, and money, check out Offering Tree. Don't forget to grab your special discount at offeringtree.com forward slash MBOM. Now, today on the podcast, I am thrilled to be joined by Nancy Gerstein. Nancy is a yoga and meditation teacher, an author, a mom, and the founder of Motivational Yoga, which is a practice that helps empower and clarify one's life decisions, goals, and results. Nancy's classes feed the body and the mind, encouraging students to make conscious choices about how they direct thoughts, energy, and focus to live the best lives they can. In this episode, Nancy and I dive into discussing how to plan and promote a workshop, both in person and online. Nancy shares her top tips for deciding your workshop idea, planning for your workshop, marketing your workshop, and then executing and delivering. And she gives her top tips for running a successful workshop. If you are running an independent yoga business or you're a yoga teacher teaching for multiple studios, workshops can be an excellent source of revenue and a great way to reach your ideal client and really focus in on your niche or a topic that you're really passionate about. So this is going to be a really fun episode. You're going to learn a lot from Nancy. I'm super excited to dive in. So let's get to it. Without further ado, here is Nancy. Welcome to the podcast today, Nancy. I'm really excited to have you here with me today. It's great to be here. Thank you, Amanda. Where are you joining me from? I'm here in Chicago. I'm actually in Morton Grove, Illinois. Amazing. Somewhere I've never been, but hopefully I'll get to come visit you in your studio at some point in the future. I hope so. It's beautiful here in the summertime. Not so great in the wintertime, though. (laughs) Yeah, I'm Canadian, (laughs) so I know what that's all about. (laughs) I'm familiar. (laughs) It's been a long winter. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. Amazing. Well, I'm excited to dive into all things workshops and and whatnot with you. But before we get there, I want to back up a little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about your yoga story, your yoga journey, and, and how you got into yoga? Oh, sure. I got into yoga actually in college, and that's because I needed a physical education class to graduate. And it was either volleyball, basketball, bowling, or yoga. And I thought, oh, hey, yoga is something I've never tried before. So I started attending these classes twice a week for two hours a session. 
And I had a teacher there who was dressed in white. He wore a turban, uh, who was teaching us just a few poses at a time. And it was like no other yoga class I'd ever been to since. And it was also a wonderful college class. There were no straps or blocks or mats. And actually, there were no sun salutations or inversions. We just we just practiced one pose at a time and then we rested. So I felt like I was really getting some easy credit. But by the end of the semester, I realized I was changing somehow. And I just put that together towards the very end, especially during finals. I felt calmer. Um, I knew that this yoga is really something good, although I didn't know why it was good for me. So a couple of years later, after I graduated, I started taking classes at um, a local studio near my home. And then a few years later, I just decided I wanted to learn more. And so I just decided to become a teacher. And I've been teaching for over 20 years now. Wow, that's amazing. And so can you just give me kind of like the high level overview of your career? So you start teaching and what did that look like? Were you teaching in studios or or what's been kind of your journey? Well, at the time, um, well, I owned and I, I still own and operate a marketing firm, but I, would, I actually, this is my second one. So I've owned and operated two marketing firms. And at that time when I became a teacher, I just sold my first marketing firm. And uh, I started teaching at various places, a YMCA, a park district. I was doing some privates. I, I teach chair yoga. So anywhere that uh, there were classes who needed teachers, I just I wanted to get as much as I could. And it was just it was very good for uh, my other job, which is you know being in business. So it's just a, a nice, even way to balance my life, especially with kids. Um, and at some point in all of this, I decided I was going to write a book uh, for yoga teachers. And uh, I've just written my third book for yoga teachers. So, you know, it's all kind of coming out little by little, um, the importance of why we practice yoga, how to teach yoga and what it means to us personally. Amazing. I love all of that. You've got so much good stuff going on. And I'm assuming with 20 years of teaching experience, workshops have probably been a big part of what you've done over the years. Yeah. they. I always try to do a couple workshops a year. Um, even during this year with COVID, I've done a couple of workshops, of course, virtual workshops. And the reason being is because I think for myself, I do want to learn more. And the only way to really dive into something, especially when it comes to things that are not practiced or not talked about so much in classes like the yamas and the niyamas. You know, we can dive deeper into it. We can learn it for ourselves and then create our little sub community with it. So I always like to ask my students, what do they want to learn and see if it kind of overlaps with what I want to learn. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that when when I'm teaching yoga teachers as well and talking about ways outside of teaching classes that they can grow their business, find their niche, make revenue, all that good stuff. I feel like workshops is always something that comes up. And I I really like to think about it as the intersection between something that you're passionate and have expertise in and something that your audience is excited about as well. Absolutely. And taking on a workshop is not as um, as easy as it sounds. However, it's pretty organic because if it is something that you're really interested in, you will dive into it and make your way through it. But, um, you know, I, I have a lot of trial and error along the way. And um, I put some of those, those little tidbits in my book for other folks who are planning on doing a workshop or their very first workshop. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe we can dive into workshops a little bit more because I'm sure there's lots of people listening who are curious about offering workshops and they're not really sure where to get started. And to me, I would think one of the first places would be coming up with an idea for a workshop. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Um, Yeah. The first thing that I would do that I would suggest doing is to plan your workshop. And that's getting very clear about your objective of your workshop. Uh, Visualize what you want. Ask yourself, Why are you even doing this? You know, what do you want to get out of it? Um, But but also 
ask your students, ask the community, find out what's being done and find out who your target audience is. Um, but also know yourself. If you're not somebody who wants to teach uh, a headstand workshop, <laughs> even though your students might want it, that shouldn't be on your radar. So know how you can fit in. So planning is probably the biggest part of this whole thing. Do your research and find out what else is going on. What are the offerings that other people have that you can fit in and be timely. I know that right now, whenever I bring up, you know, breathing and anxiety and not knowing about the future, people are drawn to that because they want to hear what's already on their minds. But also find out your why, you know, again, why are you doing this? Are you trying to make more money? Are you trying to get more speaking engagements? Are you trying to, you know, build your following, save a life or develop your signature and any of these things. So that's, that's all part of that very first step of planning. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And something you brought up that I just want to touch on is the research piece of it. I'm sure somebody out there is like, oh my God, research? I'm a yoga teacher. I don't do research. <laughs> the reason why I'm not like a scientist or a biologist or a historian or something like that. Can you touch on that research piece a little bit more in terms of like how you actually go about doing some of this market research before you put an idea into the world? Sure. Well, first of all, if you have, let's just say you have a topic, um, I'm, I'll use chakras because that's kind of you know general at this point. If you have a workshop like Chakras, go ahead and, and since we're talking about virtual and online, you want to know who's doing Chakra workshops. You want to you want to see how it's delivered, but you also want to learn about the Chakras and what it means to you. That being said, yes, you want to develop it within, but what is being delivered out there that really speaks to you and how do you differentiate, differentiate yourself from other people simply because they can go anywhere now? I mean, you can become international with your workshops if you're doing it virtually. So do your research about who's doing what, what are the pricing, um, who are they gearing it towards? Are they gearing it towards teachers or new students uh, or everybody? There's plenty of people who are doing things for everybody. And, um, and work from there. So just lay the groundwork. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great tip. And I think something you touched on there is really important is kind of, you know, this new world that we're living in where we can do everything online. And I feel like it kind of changes the game a little bit for how we actually run our yoga businesses, you know, not only in the way that we're, we're teaching, you know, our students that we previously taught in person online, but that we're not geographically constrained anymore. All of a sudden we have this ability to do things without these geographic constraints. Correct. And that's going to change the way that you promote yourself too, because now your net gets so much bigger. I mean, you could go all over the country or all over the world or stay within your community. So um, there are, there's so many possibilities that we, that were not available to us before. But that also changes the game, that, that changes how we do things and, and uh, how we talk to people. And can we actually see them and touch them? Are we watching them do their practice? I mean, these are all the, the questions that we have. So and also part of the research is, are you doing this live? You know, what what will hold better? Are you doing a hybrid as well? Um, so, yeah, I think it opens up a whole new world of, of uh, possibilities that will probably stay this way. I think it's, it's wonderful to be able to practice with somebody who is in another state and it's just like they're in the same room with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I work with a couple of different studios, one's in Canada and one's in the US and both are doing the hybrid model right now just because of restrictions and you know everything's changing so rapidly kind of honestly day to day, but definitely week to week and month to month. And it's been kind of interesting to kind of see how, you know, just how this sort of new, this new way of doing things. I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, your studio, your experience with pivoting from doing things in person to online and what you've been doing to kind of just keep things going. Sure. Well, my studio, and I'm going to use air quotes here, is really uh, a room in my house that I've just turned into a place where I do Zoom classes because I still work for another studio. I still work at several different places. I teach my own classes 
here, um, but I also do Zoom classes for a studio. I work at a Y and I work at, um, uh, I do chair yoga. So, and a park district. So I'm still kind of spread out in different places. And that's kind of how I pivoted. And I'm glad I was familiar with Zoom before this, before the pandemic happened, because two weeks after, you know, at the shutdown, so to speak, uh, we were back on, you know, we're back on, you know, we yogis were resilient. We're like, okay, we can't go to studios. There's another way to do it. And we just kind of fell right into it. All of us. And when I say all of us, it's like everybody that I work with, all the other teachers, so um, it just kind of happened and it did feel natural. I, I mean, it just, we didn't stop. We probably took a little break, caught our breaths and said, there's another way. So I'm, got, I'm kind of proud of, you know, this whole industry and, and how we just came back and decided, okay, let's reinvent ourselves. And we have. Yeah, a hundred percent. I feel like one, very grateful to work in an industry where there was the ability to pivot. And then like two, it's just been really inspiring to see how many yoga teachers have pivoted and how many studios have pivoted. And I know my personal experience with the studios and the teachers I work with has been that just like people just did it so fast. It's like, oh, we closed our physical doors and we're online the next day. Like we're not even really missing a beat at all. And you know, that takes a lot of like background work and energy to make that happen when you're kind of pivoting your business model, like essentially 360 degrees with pretty much no warning. Oh, that's true. And keeping your head, you know, keeping it all together during all the news that's happening and people getting sick and worrying about going out, but at at the same time, knowing that you're doing the right thing. Um, on, On the business end, I know a lot of studio owners who said, I always wanted to go online. You know, I always wanted to have this library. It's forcing my hand. And so I guess it's a yin and the yang of, of everything of life. It's like, well, it's it's kind of a happy accident for them. And now they know how to do it and can continue to have their workshops and stay in business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's really interesting. There was one yoga teacher I was working with and I'd been working with her for maybe like six months and it had been her goal to start a YouTube channel, but it always been like kind of this like back burner goal. Like it was never the the priority right then and there. And then, you know, all of this happened and within like a week, probably she had this YouTube channel up and going. She'd bought a microphone. She'd bought a new camera. She was filming videos. She just started it. And she's like, I guess like I needed this like global pandemic to actually get my butt in gear. And it was, it was sort of similar. Like the studio that I work with in Canada, we had, started a Vimeo channel and recorded a couple of videos. I mean, honestly, years ago, like probably 2018 type timeline. And then, you know, recorded four videos or five videos maybe and had it on the channel. And the idea was, oh, this will be a bonus for our members so that they can take us anywhere because we got a lot of suspensions for people going on holidays or, you know, going away for a month or two or something like that. And we're like, how cool would it be if they could practice with us on their vacations. But then, you know, life gets busy. The couple of videos were there. They did have access to it, but we never really did anything with it other than just giving like some members access. And then, yeah, this happened. And now it's like, we have a video library of like hundreds of videos. <laughs> it's I know, I know. I mean, if you teach a couple of classes a week, there you go. You have so many. And it's, it's kind of exciting because we don't know what's happening next. Um, and even look at, I'm, we hope we pray everything's going to be great in a few months, right? Just whenever. Um, but we do hope that, um, I hope that things stay kind of in the hybrid level. So that when you do go back to classes and workshops, you have the choice to be there live or, or virtual. So you can always be there and it, it's good for everybody all around. Yeah, for sure. I think there's certainly some silver linings to this whole situation. And I think that the virtual world is definitely one of them and kind of bringing it back to the workshops that we were talking about. I actually think it's really interesting because, you know, kind of the previous model was, you know, a teacher needs to find a space. They're probably looking for a studio. They need to pitch their workshop to the studio. They're going to split the income with the studio because of the rental Um, Obviously, the studio is going to help market, which is really fabulous and that type of thing. But then you've got to get you know this idea that's going to work and sell within your community. And now I think if you're an independent yoga teacher, you have this opportunity to 
reach a way bigger audience. You have the opportunity to get rid of that studio space and that cost and that partnership and that pitching. You can just Uh host it from your house if you have, you know, a decent space where you can teach from a decent audio setup and a decent video setup. You know, the big piece that I think for a lot of yoga teachers is like the marketing aspect. And that's the aspect that studios have often handled for, for workshops. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on, on marketing. And maybe we can start with talking about like successful marketing that you used for in-person workshops and kind of how that's shifted and changed to virtuals. So unlike yoga classes, workshops really do immerse the student in one specific aspect of yoga. And uh, it, Perhaps your passion is for teaching the yamas and the niyamas or the chakras or or back bends. But before you begin any of these long, tedious hours of research and preparation, I would recommend just considering these four steps. And they are to plan your workshop, see what it is, you know, what's important to your community, promote your workshop, and that includes packaging it, like naming it. Practice your workshop because timing is very important, especially when you're going virtual. And of course, present your workshop and everything that that requires. So those four steps, if you follow those four steps to a T, you're probably going to have a pretty well attended workshop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So can we dive into those a little bit more? I think you said starting with plan, right? And we've kind of touched on planning already, coming up with the idea, researching it a little bit. Is there anything else with that one listeners need to know before we move to the next step? I would say plan your workshop probably months in advance. If you do need a space, you'll need that, you'll need to get that space reserved. If you're working with another studio, they're going to help you as well. Um, but target who you're talking to, who is this for, and ask your students. So even writing these workshops out is part of planning as well. Um, Promoting, once you know what you're doing, promote your workshop, so have that plan in place. And whether you choose, and I would suggest all of these, e-blasts, social media, and event ads, um, use your website, use calendar items. There's plenty of places to post. Um, there's local news. Um, you know, there's there's actually newspapers in print, depending upon who you're talking to. There's lots of yoga sites. Any kind of promotion that you can do also requires a link for the reader to get more information and to register. So you want to mention what you're doing in every class. So you are the you're the best promoter ever, right? You are the one who's going to tell your students and the people who asked you. Ask your friends and your family to help you. Have them post and repost and comment. Um, little little bits like that really help go a long way to share your information. But um, as always, before you put this together, before you start promoting, do what we do in marketing, and that is to put a creative strategy together. Things like who is our audience? Even if you think that you know, you may have a sub audience. Just because I may be talking to teachers, I'm also talking to serious yoga students who want to know a little bit more. Um, who is your competition? That, that's a real gift to know who your competition is and maybe to learn from them. They become a resource for you. What makes you unique? And you can package your message around that. How do you stand out and why do you stand out? Um, what are your talking points? If you're going to talk for two hours, what are you talking about? Uh, You need to kind of figure that out. And that's part of your message as well. And these will help you define who you are and what your workshop is all about. So once you figure out what you want to teach and what you, where you're going with that, how you're using your social media, including, I'm sure you've heard this before, the Facebook ads and Instagram, they help you kind of hyper target who you're talking to between age groups and what they're interested in, where they live. For very little money, you can go on Facebook and just go for it and put some money behind it. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, You can start with $5, $10 and see if you get any responses. Change your messaging. They make it very easy for you. But you do want to package your workshop in such a way that it has an intriguing title 
and probably a benefit associated with it. So, and you may want to focus group that too with your, with your friends, your partners, um, and your students. So if you're passionate about it, you'll know what the benefits are. And that's, that's how we promote it. You know, we just use that benefit as the front line. That's your headline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think too, with social media, like you mentioned focus groups. And I think that with social media and Facebook groups and that type of thing, like even putting like a poll or asking like a really specific question can be a great way to kind of use the idea of a focus group in a way to like hear what your audience thinks. I agree. I um, I belong to a lot of Facebook groups for teachers and many people ask, what do you think of this title versus this title? <laughs> and it's, it's a great way to, to really find out. But that packaging is important because of that benefit. You know, have it be something that rings true. You know, why why handstands will keep you younger or you know, something like that. And just pull them in just like anything else. Um and be willing also to talk about other practices because sometimes one thing doesn't pull things in, but some, you know, like a sister science might be very helpful as well. If you're teaching meditation, you probably want to touch on uh, simple postures to help you relax, to sit for a while or breathing exercises to help that as well. So yeah, for sure. Per- Promoting is, um, you know, it's it's time consuming. And as we say in our marketing business, it is kind of 24 hours a day. It, it doesn't really end. Uh, but you also want to go uh, not only to your email list, and I hope everybody has one, to your students, but to them personally. And I send out emails, you know, hey, Mary, I'm doing this workshop and I really hope you can join us. People want to hear from you. They want that connection. They want to know that you're thinking about them. This isn't just about getting new students or clients, but it's about retaining who you already have because you don't want to just move on to the next one, too. You want to just form a wider and wider community. And you can use that for your next workshop and your next class, too. And that's how you really do grow your business. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love all those tips. So thank you for sharing all of that. Hey, everyone. We're just taking a quick break from the podcast to talk about Offering Tree. I wanted to remind you about the special discount you can get with Offering Tree. I love telling yoga teachers about Offering Tree because not only is it your one-stop shop for all things that you need in your yoga business, but it is also easy to use, it's affordable, and it's truly an amazing company to work with. Offering Tree lets you sell courses, run classes, manage memberships, and so much more with just one account. That's right, just one login for all those parts of your business. One of the best parts about Offering Tree is their online store. You can sell digital content like yoga videos, challenges, and courses right from your website. If you're teaching yoga classes and looking to level up, selling digital content is the next step to growing your business. Over the last year, we've seen so much pivot and change happen in the yoga industry and having your own unique yoga business where you offer your students different course material can be so beneficial in creating a sustainable business with diversified income. And while there's many different platforms that you can create courses on these days, Offering Tree's course tools are easy to use and they're really affordable. And if you have a website you already like, you can still use Offering Tree. But there's one other thing I want to tell you about Offering Tree that makes all the difference in the world to me and probably to you too. They're a company that truly cares about yoga teachers and the wellness industry overall. I chose to partner with Offering Tree because I love the product and I love the people. Whenever yoga teachers have a suggestion for something that they need out of the platform, they can reach out directly to the people at Offering Tree and they're actually heard. So much of the development that Offering Tree has gone through over the last year has been because of yoga teachers like yourself. So if you're looking to save time, energy, and money in your yoga business, Offering Tree is hands down the software for you. Go to offeringtree.com slash MBO to learn more and get your discount. Okay, let's get back to the episode. 
And it just makes me think about how important it is to really understand like who your workshop is for. And I know you mentioned before that sometimes people create workshops for everybody, but I feel like you really do have to have like some person in mind for who your workshop's for. So you can understand like who you're talking to and your messaging and who you want to target. And I mean, even Facebook's going to ask you that when you set up your ads, like who is this for? And so I think understanding that really helps you kind of create the messaging behind it, which is what is going to get people in the door. And I I just think of an example I saw the other day in a Facebook group. It was somebody said, what do you think of when you hear these three names? Like, would you be interested in these masterclasses? And somebody's like, these sound like they're for newer teachers, which makes me feel like they're not for me because this person who is writing has been teaching for, you know, two decades, 20 years. And I think that it is really impactful. Like the words you use are really impactful for actually getting somebody to understand what it's about and if it's for Mm -hmm. them. Right. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, And there are different ways to say the same exact things. One thing I learned from a publicist uh, who booked people on talk shows is he said, when you have an idea or you're pitching an idea for, let's just say a workshop or a book or anything else, think about that last message that people say right before you go to commercial, like coming up five ways to promote your workshop is just something to hook you in to keep you going or coming up the benefits of learning about yoga philosophy, whatever that, (laughs) whatever those are. Amazing. And so what is the next step that you mentioned? We've talked about planning. We've talked about promoting. The next one is practice. And that's practice, practice, practice. Because if you have a two-hour workshop, uh, it's going to take a long time to really go through all those sections. But before you decide even how long it is, see what people can can stomach. <laughs> you know, sometimes when we go virtual, uh, not everybody can sit for two hours or three hours, depending on how long your workshops are. Some of my workshops have been three hours. They're live. Um, but if when I go virtual, I always like to take a break. So decide, is that a five minute break, a 10 minute break? Um, Do you want to do an hour and a half? It's up to you. I'm very conscious about people's time. So if they sign up for an hour and a half, I really don't like to go past that because they dedicate that time. You also might want to think about if it is a long one, are you going, maybe you can divide it in half. So you have a couple hours on Saturday, a couple hours on Sunday. So Once you get there, that's where the practice is. You do need to time it out. You need to know what makes sense and go through it section by section. And because we're doing things virtually right now, you really need to learn how to share your screen. So you do need to tech it up quite a bit. Have those things ready. Um, Set up your camera. So if you're not doing a lot of classes or sometimes I, I see teachers are doing Zoom classes and there's no lighting or maybe there's dogs barking or things like that. But I think for a workshop, you probably just want to spiff off a corner of your house, set up your camera, get your lighting ready, get your background ready um, and make sure that you're ready to go. So I know from my experience, at least with the practice part of this, I am editing my workshops up until the time that I'm on up until the time that I'm ready. So um, if I have too much material, I need to know what I can cut. And that's really important too, because sometimes you just go with a different flow or sometimes you get interrupted by people asking questions. Um, That being said, when you're doing something just virtual, it's really just you. Um, And maybe you're using the chat and you're getting distracted. So as we know, live workshops are so much different because there can be live discussion and there can be the Q and A at the end and it becomes a little different than the very end of a virtual workshop. Um, And it's gonna affect you and your energy if you're doing it virtual or or hybrid. So keep that in mind too and practice it for other people, see how it goes and and see what moves you. So that's very time consuming (laughs) and get ready to just time it out, time out the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think those are all really great tips. And I think, you know, so much of this stuff is applicable to 
the in-person workshops, but a lot of this stuff is different. Like I think doing like a tech run through is really important beforehand. I definitely agree with you. Like having good quality audio and video is super important. I actually feel like if people are paying for your classes in any capacity, this is important at this point. I think people were very like forgiving and understanding within the first, you know, definitely first couple weeks of the pandemic, definitely first few months. But I think now we're into this so long. It's like you should be doing it at a little bit higher higher quality, I think. And at least people should be able to see you and hear you. I agree 100%. It is, uh, it's really important to set yourself up. I mean, it takes me about 15 minutes to set up for my classes now, getting the lighting ready and making sure the, the whole area is cleared. And I'm always doing things a little bit different because I'm, I'm learning new things along the way. Actually, there's a few yoga teachers who've made YouTube videos about setting things up and good microphones versus bad microphones and what's compatible with what. So there's a lot of information out there and you can do it easily. Little by little, it doesn't even have to cost very much. I, I bought these big lights that cost, I think they were about $99. I have three huge lights, including a circle light. And it's made a world of difference in, in uh, the teaching because now I can see and now my students can see. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, both the studios that I work with have done the same thing and this the teachers that I've been following along with and practicing with are also doing the same thing and it does make a huge difference. I mean, being able to see and hear that person is is super super important. And then I think also you mentioned a couple of really great things with the practice like just knowing the timing and and as with any other workshop or session that you're doing, you're not going to be able to plan entirely for who's going to show up and what questions they're going to have. And of course you want to hold space for that even online. Um, and, but yeah, making sure that you've got a plan for like what you can cut, if there are lots of questions, what you can add, if people aren't asking questions. And I think too, like zoom has so many cool features with like raising hands and, and breakout rooms. Like, I think there's definitely ways you can sort of replicate that that Q&A type experience and that type of thing. It just requires like a little bit more time, effort and, and awareness around the tech, like you said. Absolutely. I think you really have to stay mindful when you're teaching those kinds of classes and watching the chat box. And if you are moving, if you're doing asana practice, you got to be near your computer and maybe even set aside some time uh, and some space for those questions at, you know, let's say every 20 minutes or every 40 minutes that you were going to get together again and, and talk because the energy is so much different online. You don't have those bodies by you. Um, you know, you can't hear people breathing and uh, maybe you know them, but they're not in your space. So it's a, it's a good way to create community uh, as best as we can. And, um, and let everybody talk a little bit. If you have a smaller audience, you know, if you have say 20 people or less, have everybody introduce themselves so we know who's in our space together. Because even though we're online, it should feel like it's this sacred space for all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's part 100%. of the practice too. The thing is with workshops, you never know who's going to show up and unless they pre-register. So you know those folks. Sometimes people register at the very last moment, just like any other class where people decide to walk in. You think you have 10 people and you wind up having 30 people because people are very last minute. So keep that in mind as well. Just stay open minded when it comes to virtual or live classes. And as I said earlier, we're going to we're going to go hybrid. So we keep your keep your camera uh, available and think of it as maybe another student actually, you know, so mm -hmm. you get that whole workshop, you know, live workshop experience. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Amazing. So we've gone through plan, promote, practice. What's the final P? The final P is to present. And that is when you're live, you're greeting your students. Look at when you're not live, you're also greeting your students. So when people come on the screen, you see their face, you know, Oh, hi, Amanda. Hi, Mary. Hi, John. Hi, this one, that one. You know, all the all the folks, whether you know them or not, I think it's really important to greet your students. Um, let them know that you are um, grateful that they're with you. So uh, when it's also helpful, though, if you are doing virtual to have somebody looking at chats for you. So if you have a second person, 
you know, in your space with you. It's great to have them write down questions. Always introduce yourself one by one if you can. If this is live, hi, I'm Nancy. And, you know, I'm going to be your presenter for today. If Ask them if they have any questions or issues, um, but let them know that you're holding space for them and help them get set up too. Maybe they need a block. Maybe they need a pillow. Um, just help them release their nervousness because everybody's a little apprehensive when they walk in. I, I think in some respects, for some folks, probably not yoga teachers, but yoga students, they're a little apprehensive when they first walk into this space to see what they have there. Um, when you're doing this, also have materials that you can send out to people. Uh, if you're live, you may want to leave them with printed materials uh, or just send them, send it to them later. Make sure you get everybody's email address. Uh, give them FAQs if you have some about your workshop. People want to know, they, they want the kind of the end game of all of this and give them more reading material on the subject matter. Um, if you have somebody to shoot photos, please shoot photos. Of course, get people's permission. Uh, doesn't work as well in, uh, in a virtual space, but live, absolutely. Because look, at even if you have to hire a photographer to do it, you'll have photos for your website and for uh, future workshops, any kind of social media that you do, you'll just have them. You'll have them as tools. Because um, these, these kinds of things that we create here are opportunities for more and more promotion. Um, but as I said earlier, just make sure you've got everyone's permission to take and use their photos. Uh, I did mention get their names and email addresses. So make new friends and have them make new friends with each other if possible. So there's Always nice little ways to, you mentioned breakout rooms. If you can have breakout rooms so people can get to know each other, that's a really cool thing. Uh, you can do this live as well, get four people together and you know have them talk about what they're learning. And after the workshop, so after the presenting, um, stick around, be around for questions, you know, live or you know, Q&A later on. Uh, let the chat go and answer all those questions. Tell people, you know, this thing ends at two o'clock, but we're going to stay here till we're done. You feel free to leave whenever you want to and let them know that you're here to answer anything and give them your email address. They may want to address you personally. Uh, but I also like to send thank you notes to folks too, if I have their email addresses. Thank you for coming. If there's anything else uh, you want to learn about, please let me know. Uh, add any additional self-promotion uh, material that you have if you're doing another workshop or tell them about your upcoming classes or products. Send them to your, to your current schedule or your website. Um, and don't forget to ask for a follow on social media. Um, I was just at a workshop this weekend, virtually, and it on Monday, so this was Saturday and Sunday, on Monday I got a questionnaire from the teacher to, she just wanted an evaluation of how she did. Because it was only the second time she did this workshop, she, she wanted feedback, which I thought was really interesting. So she didn't ask for the name, she just wanted to know how she did. So that may be something that people would be interested in too. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fabulous idea to email people after and get some anonymous feedback so that you can make sure you're improving. And I love all of those tips. And I think that particularly like thinking about the experience of somebody walking into the studio and maybe feeling uncomfortable or uncertain or something like that. And then thinking about how like online, it's probably feels a little bit less uncertain for them because they're able to, you know, keep their microphone and their video off and kind of be anonymous. But at the same time, it's like, that's not how you build community, right? Like people want to be seen and, and heard and have space held for them. And so I think that being able to greet everyone by their name and ask them how they are and kind of, you know, try to replicate that like studio community space is, is mm -hmm. one of the best ways to be successful online. I agree. I agree. That being said, I know there's many people who just turn off their screens and oh, they don't want sure. yeah, there's no sound, <laughs> there's no video, but they're there and you know, they're there and others know they're there too. So, um, and you do have to be present to their energy as well and be respectful of that. So when people mm -hmm. don't want to talk or, or 
Um, if you ask a question, you're going around the room, so to speak, or you know, your, your Zoom screen. Um, I'm very respectful of that because I'm when I take a class, I'm usually the one in the back corner. I, I just like to I want to be the one who's hiding. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm usually like maybe pop my Zoom video on at the beginning and then turn it off and that type of thing. But I still like when somebody says like, Hey, Amanda, how's it going? It's nice to see you. Like that always feels good. So I think it's important to remember that like, you know, maybe if they don't even answer you, like it doesn't matter. You've done your due diligence and in, in welcoming their, them there, which is really amazing. No, I think it's important that that people be recognized because otherwise they're just some warrior on the screen. <laughs> Yeah. To say, oh, oh, hi, Nancy. Hi, Amanda. It's great to have you here. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I completely, I completely agree. Amazing. Well, we've covered so much in our, our time together. I think that this is a good place to wrap it up. Nancy, I know you have a couple of books out and you've just released a new one. Can you briefly tell listeners a little bit about that and then where they can go to find everything you're up to? Oh, sure. Um, I've written a few books My uh, for yoga teachers. My latest book is called Motivational Yoga, 100 Practices for Strength, Energy and Transformation. And it is for the yoga teacher. It's also for the serious yoga student. But I initially wrote the book because I realized there are a lot of teachers who were like me and struggling with lesson plans and how to speak for an hour and what do you present and how to build intention in the practice, you know, how to teach from the heart center. So this book has a hundred different lessons in it on all different things from mindfulness to the chakras to uh, workshops. I have a whole chapter on workshops and within each lesson, there's a script, there's intention, there are practices for taking this lesson off the mat and for um, for using uh, different kind of teaching tips along the way. It's really a guidebook for a new teacher and for somebody who's been practicing for a while or teaching for a while. For the yoga, for the uh, experienced yoga teacher, it gives you a lot of different ideas and different types of practices that you want may want to build into your classes. So um, motivational yoga is the type of yoga that I teach right now. So I'm, I'm drawn to that. And that is intention and will-based yoga. So it's somebody who is inquisitive, somebody who wants to learn more, somebody who's passionate about yoga and teaching yoga, and someone who asks, is what I'm doing today really making a difference in my world? and the world in general. Um, am I moving forward? And what can I do to change it? So it really, it really teaches you to look inside and, and have an intention for what you're bringing out there because I believe that our greatest value is the effect that we have on others. Amazing. I love it. And so if people want to learn more about you, Nancy, or purchase your book, where can they go to find that? Uh, they can go to motivationalyoga.net. They can reach me at nancy at motivationalyoga.net and motivational yoga is available from human kinetics and on Amazon. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today, Nancy. It's been really wonderful getting to chat with you. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate it. All right. That's the episode with Nancy Gerstein talking all about workshops. I hope that you learned a lot from this episode and are excited to start implementing and creating your own workshops. Nancy and I dive into pricing on MBM behind the scenes. So we're talking about pricing for your online offerings. And the big question I wanted to pose to her is, do you think online offerings should be free? And do you think online offerings should be discounted? So to hear her thoughts on pricing when it comes to online offerings, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash MBM yoga. I'd love to see you there. And when you get this episode, you actually get all the other episodes as well, which is pretty awesome. So once again, patreon.com forward slash MBM yoga to check that out. And hopefully I will see you behind the scenes. A huge thank you to our sponsor, Offering Tree. To start spending more time with students and less time with software, head on over to offeringtree.com forward slash MBOM to get an exclusive discount. And of course, a huge thank you to you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast, and I'll see you next week. Bye for now. 
Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode of the podcast. To find links, notes, resources, and everything mentioned in today and all episodes of the show, you can head on over to mbomyoga.com. You can find the podcast and myself on Facebook and social media at Mastering the Business of Yoga. And I would love for you to join the private Facebook community, Yoga Business Badasses. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please make sure you reach out to me at info at mbomyoga.com. And last of all, if you enjoyed this episode of the show, please make sure you hit subscribe and leave a review for the podcast. It would mean the world. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next week. Namaste. Namaste.